All right, so next talk is by, is by uh, Brian Metzger, a professor at Columbia University, who is going to talk about uh, cooling out flow models for GDs. I guess I do not work with staff or something. I'll be fine. I just want to point out one thing. I don't think that the the this physical expansion. I mean, I think so. The thing that a simple way, just with regard to the previous talk. I mean, so so if you have what? Well, I mean, if you if if you were just expanding by a few solar radii, so there's a wind camp, camp but you know, in the duration of the, of the PDE of an hour, the the, you know, the velocity of that is calculated by ten to the minus uh, uh, fifty or less. So so I think that I think this is substantially. Uh, smaller than the orbital speed, so so it'd be implying that the star punches through the disk and it's creating a cloud that's expanding much slower than the star. So I think the physical surface is actually has to be substantially larger than that, and I, and I think the black body assumption is questionable. But anyway, this is just a comment. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm sort of supposed to segue now uh, into the TDE part of the workshop. So completely changing topics. I'm not going to say a whole lot about the Emory TDE Association. Although everything I'll talk about, we now know there could be some, you know, statistically speaking, as Itai said, there should be an emery sitting in many of these uh, TD structures based on the relative rates of emeries and TDs. I'm going to talk about a model for the optical uh, and X-ray emission in some sense, trying to uh, trying to discuss uh, sort of a unification picture of, of TDs. Um, uh, and it's based on this idea that that even if we have rapid circularization, even if the breeze streams very quickly uh, convert their bulk kinetic energy into thermal energy, that doesn't necessarily mean, I think, that the black hole will be fed at a high rate. And that's because and this has been pointed out also by Begelman, Begelman and Coughlin and, uh, uh, and, and earlier by Avi Loeb, uh, that you know, the, the binding energy of a star to, to, the, to the black hole is extremely weak. So, this, so the material is extremely weakly bound relative to its angular momentum. And so if you do create quickly a virilized structure, I don't think it wants to be an accretion disk ritual. So even if we get rapid circulation, I don't think, it, unless this envelope can cool very quickly, which, which it may be if you have a very low mass star or a very high mass black hole, I think it will first go through this sort of envelope-like structure, which has remarkably similar properties to observed optical TDs. And so, so this is not a fully worked out model, but, but basically it's, you know, the idea of maybe TDs are more like stars than we think, at least initially, and maybe the, uh, did we make this problem uh, uh, too hard? Maybe there's some 19th century physics of Kelvin and Helmholtz here that, that may be relevant. So giving a sort of, I was sort of tasked with giving a general background on TDs. Um, so everything I'm gonna say in this talk is for a sun-like star, solar mass, solar radius. And remember a TD happens when you have a star that gets placed onto an orbit where it's pericenter radius uh, goes inside the tidal radius shredding a star apart. Um, this process binds uh, the half of the star that's closest to the black hole when that occurs by a characteristic energy given by the potential times the radius of the star. So, so, so given uh, by, by that quantity. Um, and then most of that, you know, one half of course gets unbound. We're starting off in a zero energy orbit. So half of it gets unbound. The half that remains bound, the bulk of that material falls back on the orbital period corresponding to that binary energy, which is typically uh, a month or so for a 10 to the six solar mass black hole. And if you calculate then the rate at which that material falls back, this, this the half of the bound star divided by the fallback time, that's highly super Eddington for low mass black holes. Um, and of course you have a tail of matter that is more weakly bound that comes back as T to the minus five thirds. Um, okay, and so one of the, 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 the mysteries of TDEs is that we sort of naively expected that if you did, this matter would come back, it would form a compact accretion disk, um, and that most of the emission we know from thin accretion disks occurs at the temperature of the innermost stable circular orbit, which is typically, uh, you know, in the far UV or so very soft X-rays. But nevertheless, when we started observing at least optical UV TD flares, they were quite bright in the optical and UV. They did exhibit the sort of rise on something that looks like a characteristic fallback time uh, and then exhibited, seemed to exhibit a T to the minus uh, five thirds decay. What was unexpected is the effective temperatures were substantially less than what you'd naively guess for a thin disk. Uh, stated another way, the uh, photosphere radii were um, substantially larger than uh, either the tidal radius uh, or the ISCO of the black hole. Um, so this is from uh, Suvi's review article showing the photosphere radii as a function of the black hole mass. Um, the X-ray TDs, they do seem to be producing emission consistent with coming from the ISCO, but the optical TDs uh, substantially larger uh, photosphere radii than the circularization radius. 
And there have been a number of proposed solutions to this. One is that the optical emission is not, we don't have to feed the black hole at all. It's not powered by accretion. We have some collisions between the streams, which are heating up matter without actually feeding the black hole. And so it's, so it's the shocks are powering the emission. Or alternatively, do have a black hole in the center that is in fact accreting at the fallback rate, but there's this sort of envelope structure or outflow that's reprocessing those, absorbing those x-rays and re-emitting them as optical emission. And this was a basis for a paper I wrote several years ago with Nick Stone. Uh, this notion that this matter that's falling back to the black hole is very weakly bound, so it may be difficult for the black hole to accept it. It may be that most of it's ejected in winds and not accreted. Uh, but because of the very weak binding energy of the matter, we assume that it wouldn't go out at a tenth the speed of light or more, uh, but it would go out much slower and would form this kind of dense reprocessing uh, uh, sort of wind or shell of material. Um, and then the notion was that uh, for most observers, that the, the x-rays would be absorbed. If this ejecta or wind had a spherical distribution, maybe along the poles where the density is lower, the x-rays would be able to ionize out. And that angle that, um, you'll get something to stare, uh, that angle that, uh, uh, that the x-rays would be able to escape from will grow with time because as the density of this thing goes down, then more and more x-rays can be, can be ionized. But I will say that, that I sort of sort of began to question this because I, I we do have evidence for outflows and TDs, but I don't know if we have evidence for very massive, you need pretty massive outflows to carry the photosphere and actually absorb the x-rays. And I think that's where you will talk about some tensions with this. Um, so, so, so I'm not saying this is wrong. This may be what's going on, but, but uh, the model I'll present is, is an alternative. In some ways closer to the, the shock model. Um, now, we also have evidence, I think, for, for increasing evidence for delayed feeding of the supermassive black hole, potentially in TDs. Uh, Kate will talk about this, I think, maybe tomorrow or on Thursday. Um, that we, also, we have a few cases now where um, sometimes we do see synchrotron radio emission coming from the beginning of the event. There was something launched during the circularization process. But other times we see very late onset of, of radio jets. Um, so maybe you know, hundreds or thousands of days, we don't see anything. And then it looks like the central black hole is activated or, or something created a relativistic, mildly relativistic outflow from the inner black hole. Um, uh, this is from Subi's paper showing, as you discussed earlier, that when, when we do see x-rays from optical TDs, they're, they're often delayed. So the, the optical is peaking, but the x-ray is uh, substantially uh, delayed by maybe hundreds of days, eventually it does start to decline. And then now this is more tentative, but there's a number of claimed uh, high energy neutrinos from TDs. And they, you know, there's three or four of these, it's quite controversial, but they don't happen when the TD is peaking, they happen later. It almost certainly must be coming if they're real, coming from the inner accretion disk turbulence in the corona or, or uh, reconnection in the corona or a jet or something. So, so there's, I think there's, there's this very tentative hints that in some cases the, the black hole is being activated later than we might have guessed. This is another example from Yuhan Yao showing this uh, two, uh, 2021 EHB where the optical peaks uh, and then starts to decay, actually flat lines. Uh, the x-rays are rising and then they don't reach their peak for 300 days after the optical. And there's some peculiar x-ray properties of these. So it's quite controversial, I think, uh, this issue of exactly what is required for the debris to circularize. Some people think you need strong relativistic precession to get the strong uh, collisions. There was a recent claim, I'm not gonna uh, 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 hearken too much on it, uh, by Steinberg and Stone claiming that even for uh, beta equals one, 10 to the sixth lower mass black hole, they found you could get rapid circularization within a matter of a few months. Um, uh, due to particularly strong dissipation of the nozzle shock, but there's been other work by uh, Clement and others showing this, this. This may not be the case, so this is still controversial. But I would say we, I don't think we, you know, should necessarily assume that we that we wouldn't we, that we will or won't get rapid circularization. But um, what I'm going to say for this talk is that I'm just going to assume that nature finds a way. Maybe some TDs don't, and we don't see them initially for a while. But, but I'm just going to assume that circularization is rapid. Um, and I'm going to argue to you that, that this, this should create potentially this, this weakly bound envelope, not initially an accretion disk. So as I mentioned earlier, the disruption binds the star to the supermassive black hole by roughly this amount. But the notion is that if we circularize fast enough, the matter that's, 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 that's undergoing the circularization process doesn't have time to cool radiatively. So, so it will try to create some kind of structure around the black hole. Um, and if you wanted to estimate the radius of the structure, you would say, okay, let's take that, that energy using the Virial theorem. We can figure out what is the gravitational binding energy of the envelope, and that gives us the radius of this characteristic envelope. And when you work that out, just equating these two, you end up with a characteristic radius, which is the star's radius 
times the ratio of the black hole to the stellar mass to the two thirds power. It's actually quite a large number, which is substantially larger than the tidal or circularization radius by a factor that's of order the uh, third, third power of, of the black hole to star's mass. So typically you know, 10 or 100 or something like that. And so this, this structure that wants to create is rotating substantially. It has the angular momentum of being on a small scale, but it has the radius of being on a large scale. And so it's rotating substantially below the, uh, the Keplerian rate, which means it's not rotationally supported. Um, this, this omega over omega kep should be like 10 to the minus three for characteristic parameters. So, so it suggests that this, 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 this structure should try to create large pressure supported envelope, not a rotationally supported disk. Not to say there isn't some matter down by the black hole in the disk. Of course, there, there has to be, but most of the mass wants to be on a larger scale. And so the, the basic crux of this is that maybe the rate limiting step to feeding the black hole uh, is not the time to circularize. Maybe that happens quickly or the time to accrete uh, because we don't have much mass down by the black hole, but maybe it's actually the time scale for this envelope to, to cool, which then enables the density to rise near the black hole, enables the formation of the region. And so if I just take, I'm not going to put too much stress on this, but if I just take, uh, oops, if I just take this uh, uh, zero radius and, and I you know, overplot it on, on Suvi's plot of the photosphere radius <laughs> with black hole mass, it's not great. Well, on Johan's plot, um, it, it goes something like this. So, so it's a, it's a, the right radial scale for the photosphere radii we see. That's my point. So that motivated this idea of this cooling envelope model, where I, I just postulate that this envelope is formed, and I simultaneously fault solve a few equations for the mass of the envelope, which grows due to fallback accretion and accretion onto the central supermassive black hole. The uh, envelope's energy changes due to radiation from its surface. It's radiation pressure supported, so it has to radiate essentially at the Eddington ratio, I do allow for potential for feedback from the central black hole at some rate that's proportional to uh, the accretion rate. And I assume the accretion rate is related to the density of the disk on the circularization radius with, with some viscosity controlling the, the inflow rate to the black hole. Uh, I do allow heating of the envelope by fallback material, but I assume that the matter uh, is dissolved into the envelope at the pericenter of its orbit, which is where it's most susceptible to Kelvin Humboldt's uh, instabilities. Um, and then you just solve the, the system. And I'll show you later some, some light curves. You can track then the, the optical UV emission from the cooling envelope and simultaneously track uh, the accretion rate onto the black hole. Uh, to, to Elliot, uh, ask about this last time, uh, 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 wh why this differs from some say an ADAF in, in, in a galactic nucleus case or bond accretion or something. I think the point is, is that you know, for this for a particular density profile for this envelope, the, the envelope can cool faster from the outside than it can accrete, you know, in through the inner boundary. Um, so, so that's I think that's that that's sort of the, the key. So the density is 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 is, is rising at the inner radii because of interaction with the envelope. Um, so so let me just go through the simplest case so where you don't include any feedback from the supermassive black hole. So uh, we have just pure Kelvin Humboldt's cooling of this envelope. So as I said before, it should radiate uh, at the Eddington luminosity. Um, if you just calculate then the, the cooling evolution that will take place as one over time. Uh, uh, and on the Kelvin Humboldt's time, which is just the initial binding energy of the envelope divided by the Eddington luminosity, this works out to be uh, of order 20 days. And, and, and uh, as you go to more massive black holes, these envelopes cool faster. So they will more quickly become disk-like um, and then the effective temperature is just the rate of the luminosity uh, divided by the radius squared to the one fourth power. Um, so you get a characteristic effective temperature uh, pretty close to observations. And then if you're in the optical band, if you're on the Raleigh James tail of the emission, uh, what you observe is the effective radius squared times the temperature. Uh, and that decays as uh, T to the minus three halves, which is, as you'll see in a second, coincidentally, similar to the, to, to the T to the minus five thirds that we see in these light curves. So, so this, this model makes a number, it's just a pure Kelvin Humboldt version of this, not including feedback from the black hole, makes a number of, some, uh, of, of predictions. More luminous TDs should come from more massive, supermassive black holes. After we observe a TD, we should see the photosphere uh, contract. Uh, they should become, however, moderately hotter in time as the photosphere contracts from the, I guess you have to give the Zavero theorem. Um, and uh, and as I already said, in the optical, you should go as t to the minus three halves during this phase, which is quite simply similar to that. Uh, 
So let me just, I'm, I'm not going to claim that the observations definitively uh, 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 prove this, but I'm just going to show you, compare these different properties to some of the observations compiled by, by uh, optical and X-ray observers, mostly optical observers. Um, so, so this is a compilation of the black body luminosity of TDs as a function of the host stellar mass, which is some imperfect proxy for the black hole mass. And if I squint my eyes and say, okay, it looks like there's some kind of positive trend here. It does look to me like more massive uh, uh, hosts do host TDs that are, are a bit more luminous, but you could also argue it's a scatter plot, um, but it's a little more uh, convincing in Johan's paper that there's maybe such a trend. Um, uh, the model predicts that the photosphere should contract after TDs and they should become hotter in time. So let's look at that. This is the photosphere radii of TDs. This is the effective temperature. So you see that they indeed are contracting roughly as T to the minus one. And this is a little less convincing, but they do seem to be getting hotter. Now, I don't know what's happening where I have the dragon here. This is the circularization process, the formation of this envelope. It's probably very messy. I'm just assuming it's formed and, and, and asking what happens after that point. Um, uh, another thing I realized last night uh, is that if, if uh, well, I thought about this a while, but I thought I'd throw this up here. So we do see, you know, emission lines at TDs, which have typical uh, full with half max velocities of thousands or tens of thousands of kilometers per second. This is showing a compilation from this author's name I can't pronounce, so Charlotte. Okay, anyways, <laughs> apologize. Um, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but anyways, you know, so what, so I'm not saying this, that there isn't eventually will be some kind of disc-like uh, emission, but you will get uh, convective motions in this envelope. It has, it's basically a star that's carrying the eddy luminosity of a black hole. So it's very vigorous convective motion in order to be able to carry that energy flux out where it's actually nearly sonic. Um, and so if you just do the typical estimate, I take the mean density of the envelope when it forms based on its binding energy, and calculate what are the convective velocities you get of order thousands of kilometers per second. And this might uh, be follow these scalings, might expect it to contract slightly with time. I, I don't know, the observations are kind of all over the place, but the order of magnitude of the number you get, thousands of kilometers per second is the correct one. Um, but this is highly, nearly sonic uh, turbulence. So uh, you can ask me later if this can make a dynamo, which might give us magnetic fields we need. Uh, so this is just an example calculation. I'm just showing the total luminosity in blue versus time after circularization, the effective temperature. Uh, and, and if you're in an optical band, I don't remember what band I chose, that's the luminosity you would see for a canonical solar mass star. It's just what I said earlier. You have roughly constant total luminosity. It's augmented a little bit by fallback at the beginning. Uh, you get hotter with time very gradually and your light curve decays. And in this model, the, the black hole is, is, is fed at a low rate initially, but as the envelope contracts, the density rises near the black hole, the uh, accretion rate uh, rises. Um, so that's sort of a proxy for the X-ray. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying there's no, it's perfectly spherical. Um, you know, I assume that, that there must be some kind of rotationally, uh, centrifugally open funnel. Um, okay, so right. Right, right, right. Uh, and then I think, so one model, the, the dashed model is where I allow the black hole to accrete. The other model is, uh, so I allow the accretion of the black hole. So eventually that truncates, uh, truncates the evolution as the black hole eats down below. Um, so one of the interesting aspects of this model is that, you know, the black hole accretion rate is rising gradually because you're, because uh, the envelope is contracting. Uh, and so you really have a delayed sort of peak feeding rate of the black hole is substantially delayed from when you form the envelope. Uh, and you can estimate roughly how long it will take for the envelope to contract from its initial weekly bound radius to the, the tidal radius. And this works out to be typically of order a, a year or hundreds of days. Um, um, and so this is maybe, you know, maybe one of the time scales for why we're getting these delayed radio flares, potentially some of the flares why it takes a while for the X-rays to rise. And maybe it suggests that more massive black holes should do this faster so they may more quickly evolve to become uh, uh, X-ray luminous. The optical phase would be shorter. Um, you can include in these models uh, feedback into the black hole. So, so you add an energy source to the envelope that's proportional to the accretion rate. And the effect is that it basically causes the, the cooling of the envelope to be delayed. It sort of, uh, sort of can produce more flat 
uh, optical light curves because the feedback is holding up the envelope. So it sort of delays this process of, 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 of forming uh, the disk potentially. So you can get more complicated light curve shapes. If you, so this is a, if you compare a model where I have a 1% efficiency versus 10 to the minus three for the feedback parameter. Um, whatever that is. Um, so now, okay, so what is, have you heard me talk in Columbia? You've heard all this before, mostly. Um, what I've been trying to do now is to take this simple model and actually apply it to a population of optical TDs to do inference uh, a fitting to see if the population makes any sense. Um, and so this is just a, a spattering of models where we vary viscosities and black hole masses and stellar masses. Um, uh, and, and make predictions for these different properties. So what we've been doing with Nikhil Sarin is to take a sample of 13 ZTF TDEs, uh, attach a phenomenological rise uh, on the fallback time essentially for the formation of the envelope and then attach it onto the cooling envelope model. And so the model has currently uh, five free parameters, the black hole mass, the star's mass, the penetration factor, which mostly controls how far the star has to contract to the tidal radius, this feedback efficiency on the black hole and the viscosity of the inner disk. Um, uh, and then we just do the parameter fitting and see uh, what it gives us. Um, this is the result for these uh, TDEs. Um, this is the black hole mass, the star's mass uh, beta. And then this is the time scale in the model where the model terminates, which is when the envelope has essentially collapsed down to become a disk that no longer it's valid to consider it as a rotationally supported envelope. Um, and I don't want to dwell on this too much on the bottom, then I've, we've condensed the sort of probability of these events um, and compared them to some naive expectations from loss cone theory. Um, so not accounting for any selection effects that might go into these light curves, but uh, you know, roughly speaking, we do see something that looks kind of uh, what you might expect for the, the black hole distribution in the pinhole regime. Uh, it's, it's not quite as, it, just, it seems to be a slight deficit of, of lower mass black holes. Uh, the stellar IMF is, again, maybe there's a deficit of lower mass stars, but you can kind of see an IMF-like trend in the data. And then we find actually a, a sort of unexpectedly a high number of high beta uh, uh, TDEs, which we heard earlier from Mike, maybe this is because we have, uh, have a more Phil Lofscon than we, than we think. Um, and then you sort of characteristically get timescales of hundreds to thousands of days for when the envelope terminates. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read into these too much. I mean, we, we have ideas about why we might under, under the selection effects if the flares are, are dimmer uh, or if there aren't any black holes at sufficiently low mass black hole uh, regimes, maybe there's an underrepresentation there. Um, also, we don't see a whole lot of evidence in our model fitting for higher mass black holes, but that's not surprising. As I, as I said earlier, for, for higher mass black holes, the cooling time of the envelope is very short, so I don't expect it would stay as an envelope very long. So they may not be as optically bright as, as the X-ray ones. So um, that's essentially everything. Uh, I'll just kind of recount what I've said. Um, I think the main point is, is I'm not convinced that rapid circularization leads, leads to rapid feeding of the black hole. These, these envelopes are bound by 1% of the Keplerian orbital energy at the tidal radius. I, I really do think in some sense it wants to form something that on this outer scale is more pressure supported. Whether this model captures that or whether it's more disk-like, I guess that's an open question. Um, uh, but I do think it's intriguing that if you just calculate the properties of that envelope, its size, uh, its luminosity, uh, you kind of naturally get properties of optical TVs. Um, and you actually get this fact that the envelope will contract, the photosphere will contract with time. And, uh, and you do get this decay that's remarkably similar to T to the minus five thirds. Um, and then this may be an alternative to a pure reprocessing scenario where there really is an X-ray source in the center that's doing T to the minus five thirds, we're just only seeing a portion of it. It may be that the black hole feeding is actually delayed. And this is why we don't see the radio flares or X-rays peaking until somewhat later times. Um, and then what needs more work is, is, is this issue of whether we can explain uh, velocity features in TDs, which are, I understand, just erratic all over the place in terms of the shapes. Could those be convective motions in this kind of kind of envelope? Um, 
I will say some efforts in spectral polar imagery do suggest that the photospheres and TDs are fairly spherical, but there are contra contradicting claims, I understand it as well. So, so these are kind of, to me, the open questions is, is if we do get rapid circularization in the simulations, or we do get circularization at all, can we see this envelope form in the models? We just need to run, instead of just, you know, we do see the extreme collisions. If we run it long enough, do we eventually see these envelope forming? Um, you know, uh, where does the debris stream that's coming back deposit its energy in this envelope? Because that controls whether it's an important or non-important source of heating of the envelope. Uh, are there outflows? I suspect there, we, we do see outflows. I'm just saying they don't carry away most of the envelope in this scenario. Um, particularly during maybe the circularization phase when the fallback is highly super Eddington. It's a super Eddington heating source for the envelope. Maybe there are outflows during that phase. Uh, and then there's also the question, if we do have this convective envelope, uh, it turns out that the Rossby number of it initially is large, so it shouldn't be producing an order magnetic field, but as it contracts, uh, the Rossby number drops. Maybe at some point you can get a dynamo and creation of magnetic flux, which is what you need to power the black hole jet. So um, with that, I'm just going to show you. So you, it's, it's a bold kind of idea. I mean, I like it. Um, so initially in the standard picture, you have you know, this star coming in on this you know, nearly parabolic low angular momentum thing. Uh, and when people normally talk about circularization, uh, you know, so you have some orbital plane and your disc, you know, neglecting precession, all that business would stay in that plane. And so when people mean circularization, you're kind of dissipating the eccentricity from some you know, nearly parabolic thing to some circular thing. Here, I would almost not call it circularization. I'd almost yeah, call it like virialization or something. Yeah, I shouldn't. I shouldn't have called it circular, but that's. Yeah. What people, yeah. I mean, you're 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 struggling. You're just saying, well, because it has you know comparatively low angular momentum to energy, it wants to be kind of some extended puffed up spherical structure. So really, what you're doing then is you're kind of generating a lot of velocities out of the initial orbital plane to generate this kind of spherical structure. And the density is obviously you start off at a stellar density and you're ending up at this giant spherical thing with a much, 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 much lower energy. So is it really, and you use conservation of energy to determine the size of this giant spherical structure. But I mean, in the traditional picture, you're having strocks from stream collisions that are dissipating. You have kind of you know inelastic collisions that are dissipating energy. Um, is it really, whereas your thing is almost a quasi-elastic Kind of picture to kind of conserve energy and puff up into this giant structure. Is it kind of really well, we're realistic conserving, we're to conserving kind of energy? But the question is, where is the energy going? I mean, in Canadier, the that fall into the black hole has to come out with radiation. Yes, I guess that's the, we yeah. don't see that we don't see enough radiation coming out to to bind it by more tightly than it comes in. So yeah, yeah. That your idea is basically saying you can kind of quasi elastically kind of whether the you know, convert the streams into this big puffed up structure without kind of radiating away enough to make it more disc-like. And I guess, you know, is that kind of, can you see that hydrodynamically, is that viable? Well, yeah, I think that's what, I, I, I think it would be nice to, to, to see it. I, I, I find it difficult that it, that it won't find that configuration unless you're like infecting a bunch of energy down through the black hole or as you say, radiating. Yeah, I would think it would but be- But I'd say radiating. we don't see if you integrate the, the radiation from the TDE, it's, it's not enough to, to, it's not enough energy to, 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 I think, bind, at least for the early parts of the TDE, the rising part. I don't think there's enough energy radiated that we observe to, to bind the material down to the circularization point. Uh, so I, I think it's so, yeah. In already from simulation of stream stream collision, we do expect to have a large scale envelope forming so mm -hmm. in this direction already, even without any. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So my question will make it even, even more extended. Uh, I'll show tomorrow, but we have now six examples of late time brightening x-ray TDEs that literally look like this exactly become bright at day 200. So it's nice. Um, so I'm really interested to compare. One of the issues though, is that when they're initially detected in a sort of x-ray faint state, they have a thermal spectrum, but if you interpret the radius of the spectrum, you'd, it's unphysically small. So I don't know if you can comment on, you know. Right, so you're saying, I think you're saying you see basically the same temperature for the yeah. x-rays, but then it's, it's just, just the luminosity, luminosity is rising. So 
Yeah, I have to, I have to think. Uh, I mean, I don't have, I don't, yeah, I don't know if I have a great model uh, for, I mean, definitely, I guess in this scenario, it, it is a fair point that in, 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 in this scenario where I'm saying there really isn't, an, I mean, it's different than this, than the one I started with. I mean, it, just to in this picture, there, there really is a, a, a there really is X-ray source in the center, which is the volumetric luminosity. Uh, um, and, and then, and then in, 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 in this scenario, um, that I, that I've, uh, actually, uh, yeah, so, so here, well, actually the po posterior is for this, this, the sample we modeled, I guess I put them here in terms of their X-ray luminosities. Although again, I, I don't know if I trust this because really we just calculate this as 1% of M dot C squared. But I, I think that I think the point is, yeah, that, that actually we are saying that and, you know, intrinsically the black hole in the center is is accreting at a low rate, uh, and we're getting all but we're getting all of that emission through this highly geometrically beamed funnel whose geometry I don't really know. Um, so whether that can conspire <laughs> to give you know the same temperature uh, with just a range of different luminosities, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, and then one other thing we see in the optical, so not in the x-rays, but we do see, and I'll show tomorrow some fun examples of rebrightening. So I'm wondering, does your model allow for the optical emission to have any kind of interesting structure to it? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. In my models, this, this, this sort of ramp up at the end is unphysical because the envelope is kind of contracting. And then, so at the end, it's, 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 it's very quickly like you know feeding a last kind of burst of accretion <laughs> onto the black hole, but at some point the the model is itself uh, breaking down. So whether I would get you know whether I would get some kind of brief uh, brief phase from that, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have a great reason why the photosphere. So when you see these rebrightenings, is the is the photosphere radius growing again? Uh, for the optical. Yeah, I guess I'm. Um... I don't think we have a really good constraint on the SED doing okay. that, but I could look. Well, yeah. So I don't. I don't have. I mean, I think we can get like I can get one flare in this where where the where the envelope is turning into a disc. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, um, I guess it really depends on if this burst in accretion is is if the envelope is still somewhat extended, whether some of that would come out as as optical or not. Um, now let me think about it. Okay. So Ryan, just the idea, but if I understand correctly, are you suggesting in your model that there are no stream stream collisions? No, there there, there are stream collisions. Well, okay, yes, the, the, I'm not I'm not waiting down this, this path. I mean, some people I think I think there's there's argument about whether circularization is accomplished by stream collisions or whether circularization is accomplished by nozzle shocks, yeah. and I'm I'm agnostic to that. Uh, <laughs> So, so uh, all I all I would say is I want it to be fast. I want I wanted to I wanted to be fast, uh, and and um, and so so it, it's with fast or slow. I would almost it's not circularization. Circulation dissipates energy, and you don't want to dissipate energy. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, it's a you, bad terminology. You're gonna get circularization by uh, redistributing the energy as well. So in a fully algebraic simulation, you can still have some rotating structure in the center, but the puffy envelope in the outskirts. So I will call it sphere spherization. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you go from like a spaghetti to a sphere parameter? That's the question. Um, well, okay, the, the, yeah, the stream. Okay, the, the, the streams. Okay, there's two two scenarios. One is that the that the streams go through Perry Center and they collide with another stream. And then that that creates this hot volume filling debris, which over time dissolves the the remainder of the stream. And that's what. Um, yes, that's that. This is this. It's is, a question of whether the collisions are like if they're all like inelastic. You're dissipating a lot of energy, and if it can, that radiation can escape, then it, it's going to turn just something into a nice little ring and disk. Right. But if it's just changing directions, and yeah, not, that, uh, hmm? uh, these collisions would be radially efficient. You know, it will be relatively inefficient. Yeah, so that supports my scenario. So, that essentially it's just redirecting. You basically um, you have elastic collisions that are changing the directions of the uh, it's motion. More like it's colliding, and then it just pops up like a spherical. Yeah. So so it's like puffing up. So it's changing the direction of the velocity without changing the magnitude of the velocity. So it's not. I would not. I would not. Uh, well, it's turning it into random. Yeah. Yeah, 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 random velocities, random, yeah. unlike the star, which had a nice, well-defined orbital velocity. Yeah, I mean, I can you've got this giant sphere. I think it would look something like. Oh. 
the view stream colliding here and then here the energy is injected in the stream uh, as a result this uh, because of large optical depth the other energy is lost is not lost from the system when that the there's an expansion that keeps going but if you think about individual molecules, particles or things now exactly so that now the arrows are in all directions yes. whereas before when it was in the stream they were all parallel to the stream so you're changing the direction but, of the but also but also the, this matter is hotter than it was yeah. so there's random there's there's yeah. the thermal but, the, yeah. but it doesn't end up centered on the black hole but if, if all of it went into heat and none of you know uh i guess you'd have pre it's a question of to what extent it's um you know pressure supported versus well you know, yeah I, I, I think that yeah in, in my picture i'm making a pressure supported but probably to this 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 turbulent convection from the, the envelope is also supporting but then the question of whether there's any support remaining from bulk motions yeah, I mean, it's so it's not like a star is an hydrostatic equilibrium pressure. Theory. This thing is big enough. I mean, it's so big. I mean, is the collision? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just saying let's let's turn it all into thermal energy and see what happens. Um, uh, yeah. In your case, yeah. No, no, no. The, the big difference with the star, which I'm still confused about, is that there's not a vacuum clear in the center of the star. But this is not an infinitely fast vacuum cleaner, I think the point is. So the case I, I think we know the answer for is if you just had a spherical, everything was spherical, yes. and you put a black hole at the center of your configuration, a rarefaction wave goes out and it accretes on a free fall. Cooling time doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's basically what happens during stellar core collapse. Cooling time doesn't matter. Bottom drops out. Everything pre falls in. Um, yes. Yes. So somehow here you have. It's, but it's, it is it, the, the center part is is, is 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 rotating. So there is a centrifugally supported part of the structure. It just doesn't have. Right. But somehow that mass. is supporting the pressure supported spherical part. That's the transition that at least I find confusing. I agree. There's some intermediate have, layer where yeah, the ocean that, transitions from being mostly right. rotational to more thermalized right. random. Right. Yeah. Or does it just, does the inner part just free fall onto your disk, increasing the mass of the disk, increasing the thickness, <laughs> driving M dot in the disk up? Now, how does the disk, but it, but I guess I'm trying to figure out, yeah, how does the disk, okay. I think this is a question of what is the density profile of this on the Doing the angular moment profile, no? The angular moment profile, or you are worried about? Yeah, I'm worried about the so at the transition from pressure supported to rotationally supported. What is stopping the pressure supported stuff from just continuing to flow? I mean, I, there's. Oh. Mm -hmm. The pressures. I mean, okay, so 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 yeah, there, there has to be a transition point uh, between these two. Um, but I also don't know how I, I also don't know how you create a, a, a disk that where omega over omega Keplerian is ten to the minus three, which is what you have. Uh, or sorry, yeah, uh, or sorry, uh, well, omega, think, omega squared over yeah. omega three. So well, so we, we can talk. We can talk. Okay. Okay. No more questions. Uh, let's thank Brian again.